which came into force yesterday. These decisions have not been made lightly, and I hope islanders will recognise the serious position we find ourselves in and the necessity of introducing these new measures. I know that collectively these measures represent a significant restriction on islanders, particularly at this time of year, when we want to be celebrating and spending time with loved ones and friends. But we need to prevent our health services from being overwhelmed and to ensure we are still able to celebrate during the festive period. I'm now going to hand over to the Health Minister, Richard. Thank you, Chief Minister. We now have more than 300 active cases in the island, eight of which are in hospital and one is in a local care home. The projected R number is currently between 1.6 and 2, and this means that each case is on average passing to more than one other person. This will result in the number of new cases rising exponentially. We have always said that winter would lead to an increase in cases and our greatly expanded testing capacity means we are detecting far more cases than we otherwise might. However, this rise in cases is concerning and we must act to protect our healthcare capacity and safeguard those islanders who are most at risk. In a realistic worst case scenario, we could see cases continue to exponentially grow and the number of active cases continue to double roughly every 13 days. This trend would result in around 1,100 active cases by Boxing Day, with around 12,000 direct contacts being required to self-isolate. This would amount to more than 1 in 10 islanders being in self-isolation over the festive period and considerable strain being placed on our healthcare system. But all this is without taking action. So it is vital to take the action the Chief Minister has announced just now. Further compounding these challenges is the fact that due to the incubation period of COVID-19 being up to 14 days, we know that the active cases we see today are the result of infections which may have taken place days or even weeks ago. And therefore, notwithstanding the measures we are announcing today, we need to understand that we will continue to see an increase in the cases in the days ahead. It is vital that we therefore implement these measures in order to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to reduce the numbers of active cases which we will be seeing later this month. Doing so will reduce the strain on our healthcare capacity and increase our ability to protect those most at risk and save lives. Without action, we will have to implement further, even more stringent measures. Sadly, because of the increase in cases in Jersey's General Hospital and to protect both patients and staff, I've also taken the difficult decision to suspend visits to patients at the hospital. This decision was announced earlier today and it is now in effect. I know it will be extremely distressing and frustrating to many islanders, particularly at this time of year, but it is necessary to reduce the risks faced by patients and staff. The policy will be kept under constant review and exemptions are in place for children and vulnerable adults who may be accompanied by one other person wearing appropriate PPE. The maternity, paediatrics and the special care baby unit will remain open for visitors with strict PPE measures in place. And special arrangements will also be made for the families of any patient on an end-of-life care pathway. As a further measure to increase our health care capacity, we can, if it's needed, activate the Nightingale Ward. And this facility is now prepared to be ready to receive patients within 24 hours, and we will do so at short notice if the demands on our health care system require it. And let me be clear, we are nearly at that trigger point. 
I would now like to hand over to Dr. Ivan Muscat to take us through the data which we are seeing and outline the latest medical advice which has informed these measures today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, Chief Minister. Um, I'd like to uh, expand on some of the data that has been presented uh, in a, uh, both verbally and in a pictorial fashion. Uh, the first slide uh, looks complicated, but if we go through it slowly, it will uh, make uh, a lot of sense and describe the picture that we are facing very accurately indeed. The blue line uh, shows the uh, average number of uh, new cases uh, uh, seen uh, per day on a seven-day rolling day, uh, seven-day rolling average basis. And as you can see, after around the 20th of uh, November, the rather flat blue line became uh, a steep slope. Uh, coming up to around 36 uh, uh, cases per day on average over a seven-day period. The number of tests per day uh, has remained relatively stable as depicted by the green line uh, just underneath the blue line in the earlier parts of November uh, but uh, and remaining fairly flat as we go towards late November. So the, the divergence between the blue line and the green line indicates that the number of tests, the number of positive tests emanating from essentially the same number of swabs had gone up significantly. The number of positive tests is on the up. The positivity rate is most definitely increasing. The positivity rate among symptomatics is of the order of 20%. The positivity rate of the direct contacts has gone up to about 5% from about 3 to 4% uh, more recently. As a result of that increase in uh, cases, the R rate, the reproductive rate, has gone up. And this is shown by the thick pink line uh, and shown as a thick pink line because of the confidence intervals that we need to use to describe the R rate uh, reasonably accurately. And that was fairly flat uh, in early and mid-November. So one case generated another case and reflected, of course, in the flat blue line that you can see over there. But then latterly, uh, that flat line picked up, unfortunately, and has now gone up to a range of between 1.6 and 2. In other words, one individual on paper is uh, infecting about 1.8 other individuals. So that means that we have entered an exponential phase. So if we extrapolate uh, what we're seeing now to Boxing Day on a linear basis, assuming a continuing case rate of, say, 40 a day, then by the time we get to the 26th of December, we will have 560 active cases from the 290 or so cases that we have today. Our 14-day case rate will be, per 100,000, will be 560. We will have about 6,000 direct contacts. For every positive case, on average, we are seeing about 10 direct contacts. And the hospital admission rate, based on uh, what was seen in the UK, will be of the order of about 2.6 admissions due to COVID per day which means that in the hospital, at any one point, we would expect to have about 36 COVID-positive patients. That's quite significant. But of course, the growth of COVID is unlikely to be linear and is more likely to be exponential. And if it is indeed exponential, if the doubling time is every 13 days and stays at 13 days, then by Boxing Day, we will have approximately twice as much activity as if 
expansion were linear. So on the 26th of December, if the doubling time was 13 days and stayed at 13 days, then the number of active cases in box on Boxing Day will be about 1,100, with about 10% of the population being in isolation as a result of either infection or direct contact. And that would include 10% of all healthcare staff. Uh, and uh, we need to remember that uh, lockdown in the United Kingdom uh, was implemented when uh, the 14-day case rate per 100,000 was about 500. Uh, the 14-day case rate on Boxing Day, if expansion continues like this, will be about more than 1,000. But of course, these numbers, these projections, both this projection and the exponential projection will be uh, affected by any mitigation that we undertake. And the mitigation factors that uh, were announced uh, just now by the Chief Minister and Minister are designed to prevent this progression. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ivan, for that um, very clear and sobering assessment of our current position. So our island now stands at an important crossroads in our pandemic response. Islanders are entitled to know the potential worst-case scenario which the Health Minister has set out, and there is no escaping the fact that cases will continue to rise in the days and weeks ahead. Now, so we've got to take this threat seriously and follow the measures in place to protect our island. The measures we've announced today may be unpopular and they will be frustrating to many, but it is vital that we now all follow them to prevent the overloading of our healthcare services later this month and to avoid unnecessary deaths. By mitigating the spread of the virus, we can limit the number of islanders who are put at risk, who are infected or have to self-isolate over the festive period. The next few weeks will not be easy. We will, however, continue to monitor the situation and the restrictions that are in place. This will be a very different December, the different December than those we are used to. But the serious position we are in necessitates that we act to control the spread of COVID-19. And as I said many, many times, we all have a responsibility to follow these new measures and to protect those more vulnerable than ourselves. Please stay safe and do your part to limit the spread, because this December, the most important gift we can give to our most vulnerable islanders is the chance to safely enjoy this period without facing undue risk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, the Health Minister and I will be holding another press conference in the coming days to give a further update and to set out the Household Bubbles guidance. And we're now also going to take questions from the media. So, um, just working down my list. So, on the top, we have uh, Julie from BBC. So, we'll kick off with you. Um, if I could just ask, first of all, um, does this mean Christmas is cancelled? No, it means Christmas will be different. And so, um, uh, and that's one of the reasons we want to just look at the, the guidance for Christmas and how we can uh, react on that. It is very clear that um, we've indicated that the time frame that restaurants and pubs basically will are likely be to be shut. But obviously we're going to keep that under review. So if we see numbers improving then we can have a different view. But uh, it will be different. I think it will be quieter Christmas. Um, but uh, we want to try and make sure that people can enjoy it as much as they can. Richard, do you want to add? Uh, no, I think you're... Sorry, John. You're right. We're working on that guidance, which we're going to announce later in, in the week, to try and uh, give uh, some idea to islanders, because we recognise that they are looking forward to Christmas, but certainly... It will be a different Christmas in which we must all consider each other and protect each other. This circuit breaker is going to last until 
the new year, you've said. Uh, so what support's being put in place for the, those people who are vulnerable and may feel even more vulnerable at this time of year? Well, it's a combination. So um, uh, the obvious ones which we've got in place and are, are, are beefing up again is what we call Connect to Me, or Connect to Me rather, um, which is the... Um, if you like, it's uh, from memory, it was around 3,000 volunteers, I think, that we had that were all tied in through a network. Uh, and it was working with the parishes, and it was about getting the support for people who were either isolating or needed uh, need some shopping done, or all those type of things, or advice given. So that's the stand, uh, stand the um, default position. And uh, then, as I said, as part of the whole Christmas regime, we want to try and see what else we can put in place. So I was just wondering if you're going to up that at all. Well, I think it is being upped, or has been being upped, because obviously it was, was basically stood out, stood down near enough o over the summer period. But I know we've been ramping it up over the last few weeks. OK, thank you. OK, thanks. OK, uh, Harry, 103. Uh, good evening, uh, Ministers. Um, Staying on the topic of Christmas, Christmas is three weeks away. Um, you mentioned, I think, in a, in a statement, uh, Chief Minister, that these measures will take a couple of weeks to really see what effect they have. Then we have one week till Christmas. And I think people will be very concerned if we get to the week before Christmas and if things aren't better or if they get worse what sort of position we'll be in. And I think Islanders will find it very, very difficult to deal with a possible lockdown at this type of year after the year we've had uh, to go into a possible lockdown over Christmas. Senator Christina Moore has said, after seeing the case numbers this afternoon, she tweeted that the government has dithered since late October and could have prevented this. Why couldn't action have been taken before knowing that Christmas was upcoming after the difficult year that everyone has had to, to do something earlier to sort this out so we could all enjoy our Christmas rather than be at a stage now where we really don't know what's going to happen? Right. I think there's a variety of answers to that one, uh, Harry. Um, we did start announcing whole things at the end of August and September to start getting islanders to try and start taking measures. Um, and don't forget, where we are now is fundamentally different to where we were a week ago. A week ago, and I was just, if you actually look on the app, for example, you'll see it was a week ago today that the measures, the numbers suddenly spiked. Uh, and actually before then was when they've been encouraging people to wear masks. We finally got the legislation, the order in place, but we've been saying it for a long time. And we put the gatherings advice out, for example. So there have been measures we've been putting in place in anticipation just to keep suppressing the numbers. Now, so what's happened in the last week, um, the, um, uh, the numbers have gone up uh, a lot. And, uh, and frankly, um, I do get rather fed up of the accusations about dithering when generally people keep going for attack rather than trying to be constructive under this measure. When we saw the numbers going up uh, um, after the sort of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we met over the weekend and we put out the f next lot of measures on Monday. We were said we would kind of come back within two days, which we've done today. So we are acting. We will act swiftly. We'll keep up very much uh, monitoring where we go on a daily basis. And if we need to move forward and we need to take further action, we will do. And we've done that all the way through. So just because another politician says it doesn't mean it's true. Just on that, two okay. days ago, you Next mentioned... Next question. Sorry, just, just um, yeah. on, on that first question, if I, I may, you mentioned the new measures two days ago, which people, frankly, thought probably were a bit underwhelming compared to what's being announced today. Um, I asked the Health Minister two days ago about Christmas social events, if they should not happen, and he didn't really commit to say no. He kind of just said, unless you've got a really good reason, you, you shouldn't. Two days later, all of a sudden... We're, we're here. I think we expected this to happen, the cases to go up, you know, in these next two days. So I know it was only two days ago, but why couldn't you have announced this earlier? So are you saying, uh, Harry, that we've overreacted? I mean, I, <laughs> dithering is a ridiculous accusation. Uh, uh, Ivan's first or second slide showed us that blue line with that steep rise. And we've had people who have been working through the night to help us respond in the right way uh, to combat 
that this spread of infection in the most targeted way we can to make sure that we keep islanders safe. And that's what we're doing. We've taken that dramatic action to, to close licensed premises because we've seen that that is where the spread is occurring. And that decision has been taken and we're ready to enforce that, we're taking decisive action uh, and we're going to, um, to follow up on it. And just to be aware that the we know, and we've said it today, we've said it from many times before, that every action we take usually takes about two, two and a half weeks to show uh, whether there's been any impact. Uh, and obviously, as we said, a week ago uh, today, uh, we thought we were in a, a reasonable place, that the slight increase we'd seen at that point was starting to dampen down, and then we've had the spike. But we had already put other suppression measures in place. So we're now we're putting further suppression measures in place, and that's where we'll see, uh, A, probably in about a week, week and a half time, which will then look and back at the gathering, see if that's had any impact, and obviously two weeks from now, uh, um, as to the impact of what we've announced tonight. And at that point, we can then make the assessments and go forward. But we are acting, and we're acting as swiftly as we can, but we're also giving notice to people, because that's also been the criticism in the past, that we haven't given advance warning of things. And that's what we're doing now. Second question. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, in terms of the risk, you mentioned earlier in the week cold weather obviously being a big risk. And you also mentioned um, returning students. I think over the next few days, we've got that window of opportunity for students to come back. And I should preface by saying I'm not saying that you know students coming back are a risk. I know most students have behaved impeccably through this, I should say. But um, w what messaging is going out to students coming back? Because they, along with everyone, I should add, have got a big part to play, but they might be overseas right now and not, you know, be really tuned into what's happening here. And it needs to be made very clear to them that, you know, we're at a serious point now. Pick up or fly. Yeah. Um, me? I'm yeah. Either, either Richard or I'm, yeah. Well, I, I know that the education department is, uh, is communicating with them, it is going to... Uh, have people available to students or people at the uh, places where they are staying. Uh, th all those communications are planned uh, by those who are supervising that work, I can assure you. And also, so what we've also been doing, so there's been a survey going on about the um, who's coming, likely to be coming back. That's also fed into those who will need accommodation uh, because they're unable to self-isolate it through their whatever the family circumstances are, and accommodations in place and support mechanisms are in place for them when they come. So there are measures being put in place, and obviously that will include communications as well about how we expect them to behave. Thank you. Okay. Um, should we go to Elodie at Bailiwick? Hi, um, good evening, Ministers and Dr Muscat. Um, I think the first question I have is probably for you, Chief Minister. Um, restaurants, bars and cafes will have bought stock uh, after you said no lockdown. Um, the secret breaker takes away their two most, well, their, the whole month of December, which is the, one of the most profitable of the year, as well as salary subsidies. Are you going to offer any subsidies to cover the money wasted on stock? And has any thought be given to avoid um, the food waste that will result uh, from the closure? Sorry, what was the last part? Has any thought been um, given to to, to uh, kind of avoid the, the food waste that will result from the closure? So my understanding on that is that um, the reason the, fa the phase three of the co-funding scheme is being adjusted is to take account of some of those issues that you're talking about. It will also be, um, I believe, the understanding from, for example, the idea of the, the takeaway side, uh, which we've not previously encouraged, as far as I'm aware, was around being able to... Um, uh, take alcohol away with food um, is I believe that's been considered I think that's one thing that has been learnt in the UK and that will also assist them on their stock side that's my understanding uh, the guidance and all that and the measures will be again will be coming out over the next couple of days they were be, being worked on today the fundamental position is is that the co-funding payroll scheme is going to be there and we are ramping it up because of the measures we're putting in place particularly to support the hospitality side and that includes also the hotel a support scheme, uh, which is separate. Uh, just as a side note, um, is any support being given to wholesalers as well? To wholesalers? 
Yes, because uh, obviously they will be they will be sailing to um, pubs, restaurants at this time of year, and is, is any support being prepared for them as well? Well, I think the point is is that the detriment schemes that are in place, um, it will depend what's happening elsewhere on their customer side. So um, uh, you look at the whole the whole detriment to the group or to the company, depending on what the circumstances are, and if there's been a detriment, uh, then those measures are are are, are there. If there hasn't been a detriment, then um, uh, sorry. If there hasn't been a significant detriment, uh, i.e., the rest of the business has not been affected, uh, then um, uh, that is also taken into account. Okay. okay um, second question. My second question was probably for the health minister. Um, it, it was announced today that visitors were no longer accepted in the hospital. Um, we know there are at least six people who tested positive while they were receiving treatment for other conditions. Um, can you explain where was the gap in the protocols that meant people picked up COVID-19 despite being there for other reasons? Uh, there wasn't a gap in the protocols. Uh, we need to understand that whatever the best measures that you can put in place are not necessarily fail-safe. They're always risks, and I think that is what has occurred here. All the right measures were taken, but uh, COVID is pervasive and, and can still penetrate uh, the best protections. But Ivan may know more, if I can ask him. Uh, we are looking at uh, how COVID uh, uh, could have got uh, to these patients uh, to uh, learn from that and uh, obviously avoid it in the future. It's entirely possible that we will not work out exactly where uh, COVID and uh, how it got in despite uh, infection control measures being adhered to on that ward over the relevant period. We have established that in appropriate infection control procedures were adhered to. Um, so uh, that is, there is no evident gap in that uh, defence system. But as the minister said, uh, no single defence system is, is, is sufficient. We need to build up as many uh, barriers to COVID as we possibly can to try to uh, pre prevent it uh, penetrating through. Um, and as part of uh, the reaction to the presence of uh, COVID in a particular uh, ward, we, are, we have today screened uh, all uh, patients in the hospital um, and uh, will tomorrow uh, screen them again uh, because of the incubation period and going forward the intention if the, uh, if, if the plan works out in exactly the way we want it to uh, is to screen patients in the hospital uh, at, on, on a two weekly basis um, as we go forward and staff uh, on a two weekly basis as well. We will not get there overnight we will get there more, you know, sort of in a, a, a one step at a time, but we hope that within the next one to two weeks we should be able to achieve this. This is not to supplant the uh, excellent uh, PCR workforce screening that is being undertaken by uh, uh, other uh, teams within, within the COVID response unit, uh, but to complement uh, that system uh, to make it as robust as possible. Okay. Uh, Gary, ITV. Uh, Chief Minister, good evening to you. I, I get the impression from everything you've just said that you really believe you are decisive uh, <laughs> and that you've got this right. I, I just find it utterly extraordinary and based on so many people I've spoken to in town today, keeping a two metre distance while speaking to them, the general feel is this huge frustration that has suddenly got very personal to you that you have not been decisive. You have not acted early enough. Indeed, you say, we could all see on the app there was a problem last week. Well, why not do something last week? Even more so, Dr. Ivan Muscat's graph tonight showed you knew it was becoming a problem on the 20th of November. It is now the 2nd of December. Mm -hmm. And even tonight's announcements don't kick in until the day after tomorrow. Literally every day is a problem. 
you've just let it go for a fortnight. What do you say to people who think you've not done good enough? Are you ready to take some responsibility and apologise? I promise you, people are bloody furious tonight about this. Gary, um, if you go back to that graph, it isn't the 20th of November, whatever date that you're saying that we knew that we'd lost control. As we said, the indications we I had... Saw, I, I saw the graph. Uh, so did I. Um, the Wednesday uh, last week, I'll let um, Ivan comment on that one rather than just me trying to defend myself. Um, on Wednesday last week was when the numbers went up. And at that point, I don't think we thought, we thought it was a, um, a, a, a spike as opposed to a trend. But as we said, we've taken action on Sunday. We announced those on Monday and we've done further announcements today. Don't forget, we put gatherings in place uh, before last week, before this started happening, and we also put the mask stuff in place as well. You cannot, for every person who wants to see action today, there are other people who want to be told about it in advance. That's what we learnt. We got criticised in the March time for doing things uh, at very short notice. So that's why we've said... We're closing the hospitality industry on Friday. You have to give people notice on that. That's reality. You may not like it, but that's the reality that we deal with. Um, and that's why we go through all the way through all these things about balance of risks. But the decisions we've taken are what we're saying we're going to do tonight, we're announcing tonight, which is essentially that all hospitality is closing from Friday morning, one minute past midnight. Uh, Gary, I just want to say, those figures you are quoting are a seven-day moving average. They're not daily figures. I can assure you, despite your best attempts to trip us up, we get, okay, it doesn't matter about that, but we receive, as ministers, daily figures. We act when we see, when we get advice that we need to be changing our policies. We do that as quickly as we can. We meet at weekends. We meet late at night. My first meeting this morning was at 7.45. So we are working at pace at this. We are trying to keep the island as safe as we can, faced with this threat caused by people who have not been following the guidance and have been not taking responsibility for their actions. And when we see the consequences of that, we are responding. Thank you. Second question, Gary. Can I just say I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm trying to ask straight questions on behalf of people who want straight answers. I just want that to make that really clear, Health Minister. So what is your message to the hospitality industry? There will be businesses that will fold. There will be jobs that are lost because you didn't act earlier. You're now having to work sharp and hard and, in your characterisation, fast because you didn't do it sooner. What's your message to those people who are potentially facing ruin? Sorry, Gary, I'm just looking at the, uh, the, the way you're phrasing it. Um, we have always put measures in place to support hospitality. We continue to do so. And we did it all the way through the March, April, all the way through the summer. And actually, we started ramping it up again, even in October. So those measures are in place and we are looking to support the industry through a difficult time. Uh, I do seem to recall um, that actually, uh, that's probably not be better not to go there, but we were talking about people taking responsibility for their actions uh, in, over the um, uh, past few weeks. And uh, I think the message has been, or the message that now comes out, is because over time, people obviously have not, in some shape or form, uh, uh, acted in the way we've desired, this is the outcome that is happening. And uh, we all regret where it is. As I said, a week ago, or the day before a week ago, so Tuesday last week, we were not seeing these figures coming through, and we thought we were in a reasonable place. And this has come through, and as we said, it's something that's obviously been in the pipeline, and it's come through on Wednesday. We took action on, uh, we agreed action on Sunday night, and we're agreeing action for tonight. Thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that? No. 
Okay. Right. Ed, JP. Yes. Um, Health Minister, you said before that we were nearing the pinch point for activating the Nightingale Hospital. Mm. How many COVID-19 patients can we handle at the General Hospital before that happens? Uh, it, it partly depends how many of them need oxygen uh, and, and th the sort of treatment that they need. Um, you know, the, the clinicians will, will manage the numbers. It's not a political decision on uh, how they're treated or, or when we might open the Nightingale. It's, it depends on the, the severity, I think, in some cases and the um, treatments that are available. But uh, quite frankly, can I also ask Dr. Muscat to, to comment on that? Um, what the Minister has said is absolutely right. It is uh, the type of treatment uh, that is needed uh, that will, uh, together with the number of people who require that type of treatment, that will dictate whether uh, the Nightingale is opened. And one of the principal uh, factors is um, uh, oxygen flow. Most uh, COVID uh, cases nowadays are treated not by intubation and, 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 and uh, ventilation, but, but through high flow oxygen. Um, and the infrastructure of the rather old hospital we have at the moment means that we can only provide high flow oxygen at the levels needed by COVID pati patients to only a certain number of people at any one time. Uh, after that, it is uh, probably more sensible to move to these type of people uh, to the Nightingale unit. It's worth probably worth saying that the Nightingale is being constantly monitored and is ready to go. Indeed. And that's the point. We've Indeed. always said it's an insurance policy and it can be activated at sh very short notice. Okay, second uh, question. It should, it should yes, be added. Just by the, oh, sorry. It should be added just by that... The, um, mm. Hang on, Ed, sorry. Sorry, oh, just, just, just to reassure you, Ed, that the uh, people with uh, COVID in the hospital at the moment um, have coincident uh, COVID in the main, apart from a, a couple of patients, uh, rather than disease due to COVID. So they're, they're just carrying the, the, the virus uh, rather than ha being affected uh, significantly by it. Yeah. Okay, Ed, second question. Yes, um, and just by the, the general nature of the virus, um, it will mean that staff in the hospital will need to self-isolate. Um, so how um, are you going to staff the General and the Nightingale Hospital? Uh, that is, you're correct, a, a very significant uh, issue and, and a concern to us. If infection is to spread in the community, it's going to affect those we rely on. Um, so we have put together uh, a detailed plan to keep services running. Um, we are calling upon, uh, you know, our, our dedicated staff to, to step up and commit themselves even more. And I know that's a huge call on them because they are uh, exhausted and, and uh, under strain, many of them, as a result of all they've gone through this year. Uh, but they are dedicated and they are there to serve their patients. And I know they will, will do that. Um, but... You know, there will come a breaking point if we did nothing. If we just allowed this spread to increase amongst the population, it will affect essential workers throughout uh, the island, and um, uh, ultimately services would break down. So that is why it is so important to act now and, and begin to press down on these levels of infection to make sure that we can maintain all our essential services. Thank you. Right, I think, uh, given it is um, reasonably uh, late in the evening, um, we'll call that, draw that a line for questions. Can I thank everybody for their, for their questions? And thank everyone for listening. Um, these are difficult times. Uh, and um, uh, relative to where we were a week ago, this is not the announcement we wanted to be making tonight. But uh, we are serious about it. We are taking serious measures. And again, if Islanders, if we all work together, we can come through this and we can get these measures gone uh, sooner or later. But that does require all of our cooperation.
For those who have businesses, particularly those who are affected by the announcement we made tonight, there are support schemes in place. We are serious about keeping them in place and supporting you during this difficult time as well. And for anybody who feels uh, concerned around the announcements we've made, please go through the usual contact lines and support lines we've put in place. The starting one, which is easy, is the helpline, which is double four double five double six. But thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope the rest of your evening uh, goes well. Good night. <laughs>